Thank you for coming, everybody. So we've got the U13 to U17 rep and OPDL teams on. My name's Steve, and we've got Kyle Becker on the call. We'd like to welcome you, Kyle, uh, from behalf of the Burlington Soccer Club. How are you today? I'm pretty good. Uh, thanks for having me. Perfect. So uh, what we'll do, we'll, we'll throw it straight over to the, the players in a minute for some questions and answers. But before we do that, could you just, the players, if you want to pop any questions on coaches, if you want to pop any questions in the chat, and we'll, we'll come to you. Uh, Kyle, while that's happening, could you just give us a, a brief rundown of your career and how you started and where you're up to now, please? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I guess uh, much uh, similar to you guys right now. Um, I grew up in Oakville, so just right around the corner. Um, started playing for Old Soccer Club when I was, I think, when, when we started under nine. I think I, the first year I played up a year and then I uh, joined my age group the, the following year, which we were called Oakville Blue Stars. Played with them until... I was about uh, under 14, under 15. Um, that's when kind of got in touch with uh, my coach now, which is funny, but uh, Bobby Smirniotis, he started Sigma Academy, um, which is obviously now the academy program has kind of developed and, and got a lot bigger than what it was back then. We were one of the first ones. Started playing uh, with Sigma, ended up having the opportunity to go over to Europe, tried that, um, came back and ended up going to the root of uh, college. I went to Boston College. I spent four seasons there. It was great. Played in the ACC, which was a, a great conference. And then I ended up getting drafted to Toronto FC and started my professional career. Um, played two seasons in Toronto, got traded to Dallas, spent a little bit of time there, then uh, played uh, two seasons with Montreal Impact. And then from there, I ended up going into the NASL, which uh, doesn't exist anymore, but it was kind of like the, the second tier sort of sort of deal. So played a, a season with San Francisco, which was a new organization. We actually won the won the the championship in our first year, which was pretty cool. Um, spent a year in North Carolina, and the last uh, two seasons, I've had the opportunity to come back to to Hamilton and, and be a part of the CPL and uh, this great organization here. Cool. Thank you very much for that. So if you've got any questions, guys, if you want to pop them in the chat to me or just to everyone out there. So first up, so we go to Matthew. If you want to unmute yourself, Matthew, and then you can ask your question. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering before big matches like the CPO final, what's your routine to like deal with pressure? That's a good question. Um, I think, honestly, I don't really have too many superstitions. I just like to... Uh, obviously the night before, try and have a good meal and then and get a, a decent sleep. Obviously before big games like that, that can be that can be tough with, with nerves and just being excited about the game. But I think when you start getting that feeling in your stomach, you realize that you're kind of up for it. So you've done uh, all the preparation you can. Try and obviously have a, a good training session the day before a game, but really just eat well, rest, recover, kind of take care of my body. So if I'm stretching, doing some of the stuff that we have, uh, that we have uh, the option to do. So cold tubs after the training session the day before a game, maybe I'm in kind of like those air, uh, the air boots, the recovery boots, doing all that, kind of just stretching, rolling out, all that stuff. And then the day of the game, I think I like to wake up, have a good breakfast, and then do some sort of activity. So a light workout, maybe go for a jog, a stretch, foam roll, all that stuff, and then really just start focusing uh, on the game at, uh, at night. Cool, thank you. So, Maya, do you, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. When you shoot your penalties, like when you're in uh, Boston College in the ACC Championship, I think that's what it's called, how do you shape your foot to hit the inside of the post of the net? Like, because when you shot, it curved everyone, and then it hit the inside of the post and all the way in. How did you do that? That's very impressive. I don't know. I think we have to go back and watch the tape, see if uh, see if I can recreate that thing again. Um, honestly, it's just just repetition over and over. I like to hit it a free kick like that. You're just kind of going for for power to make the ball sort of dip a little bit and throw throw the goalie off with almost with your instep. If you think about it, like when the the lace of your of your shoes, if the inside lace. So if you're kind of pointing your foot like this and strike through the middle of the ball, obviously you want to kind of have your chest over it make sure your plant foot's nice and balanced so you're not leaning back or, or too far forward and it's just something that kind of comes with with repetition um it's it's tough to explain it over a call but that's uh sort of the basics of it yeah i think maybe i just got lucky on that one yeah i think that repetition was uh just practice makes perfect or permanent should we say <laughs> 
Okay, so we're going to go to Gabe. Um, how do you prepare yourself mentally before games and practices? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think it's something that's that's changed throughout my career. Um, as I've got older, I think I've started paying a lot more attention to to the preparation. As I said before, there's no distinct routine, but it's just little stuff, little details. No, making sure I'm aware of of what the coach wants from us, um, what the coach wants from me in a position as the team as a whole, how we're preparing for the opponent, knowing who we're playing against, knowing how they're gonna how they're gonna kind of come out and. And defend against us or what they're gonna kind of show us and how we gotta mitigate all their all their strengths um obviously the older you get and the more things like video and stuff like that you have at your disposal it helps but at a young age it's it's again knowing what the coach wants from you knowing what your what your role is in the team and how you can best kind of go out there and, and execute the the game plan so it's always going to change i think when you're younger it's focusing on the stuff that you bring to the table your strengths your weaknesses how you can kind of go out in a game and, and do what what's asked of you and, and show your best. And it's always going to change, but there's still the the kind of the basics that you can always focus on that if you don't have your best game, you can kind of lean on. So that's hard work. You're, if maybe your touch isn't the, the best in a game, you're going to make sure that the guy you're playing against isn't going to get by you once in the game, if that's, if that's what you can bring to the table. And again, it's going to change person to person, position to uh, position to position, but it's just the trying to make sure all the stuff that's in your control, you're you're fully aware of, you're fully tuned in, and, and you feel as confident as possible going into that game. Oh, thank you. Uh, so Jacob, we're gonna go over to you if you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, uh, what kind of risks and sacrifices did you take to get to where you are today? Yeah, it's, uh, there's been a bunch, I would say, um, obviously. I guess the one that's probably closest to you guys is is uh, as you're kind of getting into that high school age and some friends aren't really playing sports and, and they're kind of going out on weekends and parties and things like that. There's there's always going to be stuff like that you got to sacrifice. Maybe you miss a, the best party of the year because you had a game in the in the morning and you had to focus on that. And that just is what it is. It's little things like that start to, to happen in, in high school as you're, as you're getting older. And then when you start making the, the jump, I, I tried going to Holland when I was 16. So I had to leave high school and I moved to Amsterdam on my own. And that was a big one. I left my family and friends and, and had to try that out. So that was a, a great experience for me. Um, and then on the flip side, when I had to come back, I had to kind of re-enroll in high school. And I was uh, going back with uh, a younger grade. So I was doing it all kind of on my own without uh, my friends that I was used to. So it's just... There's always going to be stuff like that. Just little things you you got to miss out on a party, uh, a, fr a hangout with friends, things like that. You you move away from home, you leave family, you leave friends, all that, and that is is what it is. If if this is kind of what you want to do. Oh, okay. Ewan, do you want to ask your question? Uh, do you know when you guys are gonna play TFC? Uh, I don't think there's a, a set date yet, but um, I know they what their start is something like April at the beginning of April, something like that. So we're hopeful to to get it done before both of our seasons start. Obviously, with everything that's going on, it's a little difficult, but um, everyone's hopeful and, and excited that uh, we can have that opportunity. I think it'll be fantastic for for both teams, but fantastic for for Hamilton and the community and and our league as a whole. If we can see what we're all about playing against. Uh, TFC. Cool. So Maya, you're back up. Yep. For me being captain, what are some advice or ideas that encourage your team to win many games, even when at the last minutes of the game you're losing? Yeah, um, that's a great question. It's tough. I mean, the, the thing about being a captain is there's no right or wrong way to do it, I would say. And every captain you come across, there's, there's all kinds of different ways of leadership and, and things that people bring to the table. For me, it's just kind of being about as honest as I can with, with who I am as a player. And mine is kind of leading by example. I'm never going to be the loudest guy in the in the locker room. I'm never going to be the most motivational speaker. But if I can kind of lead by example in terms of work rate and things I'm doing on and off the field, then when we get in those tricky situations, I think we have we got faith that we got a group of guys that are all going to kind of rise up to the challenge and put their best foot forward rather than kind of turn away and, and look for someone else to do it. Um, again, it kind of comes with repetition, doing it over and over in, in training. If you're going to bring your, 
your best attitude, your best work rate. When the going gets tough, you, you know you're going to have a group of guys who are, are willing to keep going. And it's it's just about kind of putting yourself out there. In those moments, they're, they're not always going to go your way, but it's a lot of, I guess you can look at it as a, a learning curve. If you're in that tough situation and, and you put yourself out there and you try, and yeah, sometimes you're going to fail, but you at least gave yourself the opportunity to succeed, that's great. You can always kind of build on that. And you can, then you can walk away from the table and be like, what works, what didn't work. But if you have a, a group that kind of shies away, then it's always going to be tough. You're going to have that question in the back of your head. What if we did this? What if we did that? But as long as you're kind of pushing for it and, and trying to be uh, be brave in those those uh, those moments, then there's always something you can take away from it. Okay, Avani, is that how you pronounce your name? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, what are your responsibilities as a captain to your um, players and your coaches? Good question. Um, for me, I think it's just uh, the big thing that I've tried to take into this whole experience because this is the first time that I've I've had to be a captain in a in a professional setting. Is I can't ask uh, anyone on the team to do something that I'm not comfortable with doing, or I can't hold one set of standards for one guy and then I show up and I do something completely completely different because I think I'm I'm above it or I'm better than this, whatever it may be. So I think it's kind of setting the rules and, and living a certain standard and saying this is what it means to kind of be above the line in this moment and try and come in and and be that that benchmark day in and day out. There's obviously gonna be some days where you're not your best, but if you can kind of lean on those core principles and as I said, I've I've touched on it before, the work rate the the respect and kind of doing all that and, and, and holding everyone accountable to that then it becomes much easier and it's just something if i'm doing it every day i can i can be true to that and then you it's easier to hold people accountable rather than kind of pointing fingers and i'm saying this for one guy but then doing the other thing to the other guys so it's just making sure that i'm not asking anyone to do anything that i wouldn't be willing to do or or kind of holding someone else to some a different standard than than myself okay d you're up My question is that if you could rewind time to like around my age, then what skills would you have tried to learn? So do you want to tell him your age? Yeah, I'm like 12. All right. Uh, wow, if we could turn back time, huh? That would be, that would be great. Um, I think, again, it would just be doing more. Um, I, I definitely think that that was something that I did. I always was trying to improve on my own, but I still think I could have done even more. Obviously, hindsight with the knowledge that I have, um, I would have been a big one for me is just kind of playing in the middle of the field is, is being comfortable receiving the ball with players on your back in tough situations, just being very strong on the ball and confident on the ball and, and always being able to kind of turn in those tricky situations. When you look at some of the best midfielders in the world, they're the most comfortable playing with one or two guys on their back. It doesn't matter to them. They always want the ball. They're always kind of creating that three, four yards of space to, to cause all the problems and open up the entire field. And and the best ones make it look so easy. Um, it's just kind of that, yeah, that, I'd say that. Um, passing and receiving in very tight spaces is, is something that I've, I've continued to work on, but I think I would have even done more and more at a, at a younger age. Okay, Tiana, do you want to ask your question? Sorry, it's a bit quiet. Can you speak up again for us? Or do you want me to shout it out? So I think the question oh, is written. Sorry, oh, what is oh, there you go. Sorry. Um, what inspired or pushed you to play soccer? Um. Well, I have, a, I have an older brother. He's six years older than me, so by the time I was kind of walking, doing anything, I was pretty much following him around. Uh, he was he was playing soccer, and that was just something that I always wanted to do. And I think once I just started getting going and, and getting a hold of it, it's it's literally I just fell in love with it, and that's that's all I ever wanted to do. I was I was given the option to to play hockey and do all that, but never really wanted to. All I wanted to do is kind of kick a ball around, and then right away I started watching as much soccer as I could. I think that's a credit to to my dad and, and my brother. And then from there, I just continued to fall in love with it. And I just kept kind of pushing myself and, and setting new goals. But it's just something that I guess kind of came natural in terms of the falling in love with the game. There's no one that really 
kind of pushed me to do it. It just happened naturally. Okay, Andrew, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? What do you think is the biggest flaw you see in young players right now? That's, that's a tough one. Man. Um, I don't know. I don't know if we can really put it to young players right now, but I think it's it's just in general, just maybe not putting yourself out there or being willing to fail. I think it's kind of ex the expectation that it's going to be handed to us, but I don't think that's young people. I just think that's the the age you're in. I think to an extent, I had some of that. I think it's it's normal to to want that at that age, you're going through it, you feel a little bit entitled. I don't know. Everyone's going to be different, but for me, it's just keep putting yourself out there. Don't, don't just say, oh, I don't want to, I might fail. So I'm not going to do it. I know it's, it's easier said than done. It's very hard to, to put yourself out there when, when you don't really know what the outcome is going to be. But if you're not kind of set new goals and, and reaching for the stars, which sounds kind of cheesy, but if you're not doing that and, and kind of pushing that envelope and keep pushing new new boundaries, you're never really going to know. You're never really going to test yourself. And it's it's easy to kind of look back and say, oh, I could have done this, I could have done that, or I should have done this. But that's easy if you don't actually try and do it and, and put all these all these things in, in motion. So I don't know if that really answers your question. It's tough, but I guess that's one thing I would see. Hey, Bradley, you're up. Um, what players did you look up to as a kid? Uh, my favorite player of all time is Dennis Bergkamp. Uh, he played for Arsenal and he was a, a Dutch striker, number 10. For me, er, early on, I, I, as I said, I was a, I don't know if I said it, but I was an Arsenal fan and most of that was because of him. Uh, I just started watching him and the way he played was, I don't know if I, I saw something myself or it was just something that I wanted to emulate. And that's uh, someone I looked uh, looked up to early on, and then that kind of throughout the years it was someone like uh, Wesley Snyder. Obviously, looking back in, in a, an older generation, the Zidane's that would just make everything look so easy and effortless. And then you have like the Xavi, Iniesta's, Christian Eriksen, Kevin De Bruyne, all these kinds of players that a lot of them played in a similar position. So it was someone that I always wanted to emulate. But but those were guys that I, I looked up to. Uh, Emma, do you want to ask your question? Well, I was going to ask you what your favorite soccer team was, but you just said Arsenal, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that Arsenal. Did that one. <laughs> right, we're on to another Arsenal fan in Paul Challen. Do you want to ask your question, Paul? Yeah, hi, Kyle. Um, I know a lot of um, players on the call who are maybe a bit older are interested in playing soccer in university. You talked a little bit about that. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about how you got recruited and maybe some perspective on what your time at uh, Boston College was like. Thank you. Definitely. Um, yeah, the, the university route, I think it kind of gets a bad rap sometimes. The, for me, the most important part is knowing the situation you're going in into and kind of like what the conference is, what the team's all about, what the coach is all about, which can be very tough at first because obviously you're getting recruited they're going to either pump your tires, say you're the best ever. They, they they do their sales pitch to kind of get you involved, but do as much thinking as you can, ask as many questions, do as much research just about the school, the conference, the, the other teams in the conference, what it looks like, the facilities, all those things that will be at your disposal, which will obviously help your experience when you're there. Um, for me, it was, we had a bunch of showcase tournaments. We had one that I think actually still goes on, Sigma Hose, but it was at the very beginning. A bunch of U.S. coaches came down, and Boston College actually wasn't there. I was initially started getting recruited by UConn. That didn't end up working. I think a coach left, and luckily he just passed uh, passed my name on to Ed Kelly at Boston College, and it kind of happened very last minute. Uh, went over for for a visit, checked out the school, liked the liked the school. It was a opportunity to get a good education, had good facilities, played in the top conference, as I said, in the ACC. And for me, it was a place where I could go in as a freshman and play right away. Obviously, you still have to go in and do well because it's not guaranteed. But because of the the players, they moved on. It was an opportunity that if I went in, had a good preseason with the numbers on the roster, they kind of expected me to do well and play. Like so, that was my opportunity. It was kind of my position to lose. And in my 
it means trying to reach the next level of being a pro, that was everything. I need you need to play games, especially at that age, to to go from playing every single day on your under eighteen team or whatever it may be to to going into a bigger environment where you're still getting that professional professional feel where it's you're expected to to get results, score goals, get assists and and be competitive. Then it's then it was great. It was another stepping stone in the right direction. Obviously, you you want to go play Europe as that kid. You you all want to make the the big jump. But if that's not reality, it's a great kind of bridge that keeps your development going, keeps you playing competitive games, gives you sort of that feel, and allows you to see where you kind of fall into the mix. Um, and it was it ended up being fantastic because I said I was able to play pretty much every single game that I was there, which was great. Um, allowed me to learn a lot about myself. So I had the freedom to, to kind of go in and make things happen. He wasn't the most, <laughs> he, he'll probably agree with me now, but he's, he's gone there, but he wasn't the most technical coach, but it was leaned on me to kind of, all right, you have to kind of grow up and this is now sort of a man's game. You've got to compete, you're, you're expected to do stuff and you got to kind of grow up and, and be in those tough environments. So for me, it was great. And again, as I said, it was a, an opportunity that allowed me to keep my dream alive. So for that, I'm, I'm thankful. And I think that's where the, the college route has a ton of, a ton of value. Thank you. And Spencer, we'll go to you. Okay. What type of training are you doing in lockdown and what would you advise us to be doing? Uh, actually, uh, I got a Peloton, so I've been doing a lot of biking. Which is which is not bad because it's just freezing outside, but honestly, it's just I guess keep a keep a base. You got to find new ways to get motivated. The very difficult thing about this pandemic, especially when you're you're playing sports and you want to keep your development going, is you got to find new ways to to stay motivated. Whether that's little drills you can do at home with your whether your clubs providing that. I don't know. I don't want to step on anyone's toes right here, but. Yeah, little stuff, challenge, finding new ways to challenge yourself, whether it's little kind of drills in the backyard and in small spaces, dribbling around cones. Um, you're doing little competitions with your your teammates, your friends, whatever it may be. Fitness is is tough. You want to obviously, I don't think at your, I mean, I don't really know how old you are, but when you're you're on the younger side, I don't think you need to necessarily focus on, on weights as much as some people may say. For me, it's about kind of being in control of your body. So there's a ton of stuff you can do, body weight exercises, core exercises that build up that foundation that when you get older and bigger and you can start implementing all the weights and stuff, then you have that proper foundation and you're going to reduce all the injuries that potentially happen as you grow, which is only normal. But um, for me, what I do a lot is, is biking. I'll go for some runs. Um, we're obviously in off season and, and we're not back for, for a few months. So I try and keep it short. I don't really want to go for crazy long distances right now. Um, it's too cold to be running for 45 minutes outside. So I don't know, just keep it, keep it tight, 20 minutes, 5K, something like that. Just kind of keep pushing yourself that way, build it up. And you said 5K in 20 minutes, I couldn't do that on the bike. Oh, sorry, <laughs> no, five. Don't hold um, So we'll go, we'll go to Luke. Uh, what is the best skill or trait to develop to make yourself stand out? It's a tough one. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's a lot of those sort of core values. Um, obviously, when you kind of bring in, if you're talking about an actual a player, that could be, there's so much that depends on your position, the type of player you are. But something that sticks out, I think, a lot is if you, what you bring to the table in terms of the person you are. You have respect. Are you hardworking? Do you kind of the way you carry yourself, how you show up into a training session, are you reliable in terms of doing all that basic stuff? And it's stuff that's on and off the field. Um, I think that carries a lot of weight, especially as you, as you get older. Um, I, the amount of players I played with that don't have as much skill as some of the kids I played with growing up, but the people they are is fantastic. Um, coaches start looking for that, especially honestly, starting at the college level. It's, who are you off the field as much as who is you are, are on the field and those things can can translate to the player you are as well it's it's a tough question to kind of pin down but i think just kind of that more, that broader perspective of just being uh better people make better players okay uh, avery do you want to ask your question is there something you wish you knew about soccer when you were younger and if so what would it be they want the formula. Yeah. Um, the, the 
older you get, the less people generally care about you, which sounds, sounds bad, but like, like you can't wait around for everyone to do it for you. Right. Like right now you have all these people who are, who are so genuine and, and they want your development and, and want the best for you. But the older you get and the higher level you get, you become a commodity in it. So that you're, there's some situations where you can have a great relationship with coach, but at the end of the day, well, the second you become a professional, it's a business. So let's just say you're having a tough month or you haven't really, you've gone to a new team and you haven't really broken in more times than not no one's going to be holding your hand being like, Oh, Hey, come, because now you're taking someone else's position and money out of someone else's pocket. So it's how do you define and, and kind of hone down this foundation of a routine in terms of all of the basic stuff that's in your control. So sound like a broken record right now, but it's doing things on your own, not waiting around for, for anyone to be like, Hey man, let's go do all this extra stuff or let's go get an extra workout in. Let's go do, you haven't really played in two weeks. Are you fit? In, are you as fit as you should be? Whereas everyone else has been sort of playing games, having that match fitness, all the, all the stuff. The second you're out of the team, you're losing that. So how are you pushing the envelope to make sure that when your name is called and when you've done enough to get back into the team, that you're you're ready and you don't miss a beat. Um, the other thing is is the repetition. I think you can't you can't do something for. X amount of days and uh, kind of expect a result and then just stop doing it when you don't get the answer you want. So kind of having that resiliency when you might not get the answer you want, you might not get in the team when you feel like you've been the best player in training, little things like this. You you don't make a team, you get cut on a, on a tryout when you felt you were great or you deserved it. It's you say, all right, I've done, I've done this, but what do I need to do better? And how do I keep pushing the envelope so you don't drop off? It's a very hard thing to do, obviously dealing with setbacks like that is is tough and it, it is a learning curve there's I, I we can have these conversations in terms of like oh this is what you got to do when you kind of meet a a standstill or, or something like that but until you go through it you really got to test yourself and see what you're about and be able to to reflect and, and hold yourself accountable thank you okay. uh christopher how many times a week are you and your team training together and how long are those sessions? And uh, obviously it's a little different right now because we're in off season, but once we get going, it's pretty much every day. Um, the, the off days come few and far between. We're going to have to have a, a word with our coach about that one. Sometimes okay. we get a little tired, we need a day off, but no, it's, it's pretty much every day from the second we kind of come in from, from preseason until the end. Um, and training usually looks like coming for, for training, probably an hour and a half, two hours before start working on little things like prehab routines. So just kind of making sure you're feeling good, trying to prevent as many injuries as you can. Season is tough. It becomes long. You travel a lot. So you gotta, you gotta make sure you're taking care of your body, getting in a hot tub, something like that. Training is usually around an hour and a half, two hours. And then we come in and most days it's get in the gym and, and do a little workout. And in the when you're in the bulk of a season, those workouts obviously become shorter because it's really about maintaining what you've built up in, in preseason and carrying that over and keeping that base level of fitness. But sometimes when, when you have a, some space in the schedule, it becomes a little harder. So sometimes we'll mix in a double day and do two practices. Um, we're lucky enough to have uh, lunch and, and food provided at our, our training, or sorry, our, our stadium. So we kind of hang out, have meal, look at some video, and then kind of go back out for, for, for a second session and then back home and wake up nice and early and do it all again. Okay, so we've got about five minutes left. So we'll have one or two. So if we don't get through your question today, I'll try and take them down, take them down and send them off. Um, so Matteo, we'll go to yourself. Uh, when you were in high school, what was your individual training like? Um, as I said, it was, uh, I think I touched on it before. I did a lot of running, um, obviously based on, you have to base it around your, your training schedule, what your practices look like, but if you got day, days off, go for runs. Um, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of running, so I'll do a lot more stuff with the ball. Uh, I try and do everything I can with the ball. There's so much fitness that you can do, whether just little suicides, make sure you're dribbling, always kind of in the backyard shooting around, just with the ball and make it fun because no one likes just running. Okay, um, Maya, 
I think you're up next. What is the most important skill to learn as a midfielder? Um, passing and receiving. It's it's everything. I think if if that first touch is good. For for me, I'm not the fastest person in the world, so my first touch actually sometimes makes me look like I got a little bit of speed. But it's that's everything. If you can, if you're as comfortable as you can be with the ball, passing and receiving, kind of the the passing. If you got short distance, medium, all, medium distance, and and long balls, that's uh, kind of everything you're gonna need to do. But being comfortable receiving the ball with with defenders on your back, receiving the ball and, and turning and going forward, making sure that the ball is always under control. That's that's a, that's a big one for me. Okay, and I think this will be the last one, unfortunately, it's just due to time. So, Tino, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? What mental exercises uh, did you do to speed up game time decisions, and would you rec- what would you recommend for U13 and U16 levels? <laughs> that's pretty good, man. Well, when I was your age, we didn't really have as much technology as we're working with now. But there's all kinds of little drills, whether you receive a ball and you kind of look over your shoulder and, and maybe if it's just you right now in quarantine, one of your parents is sitting there holding up a, a number and you got to guess that you got to yell, yell it out before before you receive the ball. But now they got all these little kind of mind games, right? Where you're looking at the iPad and you're all the reaction stuff and any any little bit of those will, will help. Cool. All right. Uh, I, think, uh, I think tonight's been a, a huge success. Kyle, thank you very much for coming. So it's been maxed out the meeting, which is, uh, as I said, it's never happened before. This point, my phone's been blowing up saying I can't get in, and I, <laughs> I'm going to have to send a big apology email to everyone that never got in tonight. So uh, thank no. you, thank you very much on behalf of Burlington Soccer Club. We wish for, or we all hope to be back on the field soon, and we wish for have a great season. So thank, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, guys. Hope, Thanks, uh, Give you some sort of insight. Thanks, guys. With great questions. Yeah.